Well, uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all. Um, so we are going to start today with um, with um, with this um, colloquium by by Chinmay Nerke. Um, so Chinmay um, just finished his PhD at Berkeley, and um, he's now um, moved on to a job at. Uh, he's now working at IBM Research. Um, I guess at the at the outpost in Boston, which is which seems like a very nice uh, very nice place. So um, so Chinme, um uh, was recently, you know, he recently, after working at it for a very long time, resolved this uh, um, this long-standing conjecture by Friedman and Hastings called the NLTS conjecture, and um, he'll tell us all about it. So Chinme, uh, looking forward to your talk. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank. Thank you. Thanks, Umesh. Uh And let me just say, uh, firstly, that this is a very much a joint effort with um, good friends Anurag Anshu and Miko Bruckman. Um, and so, you know, uh, um, so to start the talk, maybe the first place to start is by sort of understanding classical proofs. So, you know. Classically, in computer science, we think of this very simple idea of non-deterministic polynomial time or proofs, um, where NP is the class of all efficiently polynomial time checkable proofs. And, you know, the beautiful thing from computer science that we've learned is that this seems like a very monstrous object, but it sort of can be tamed nicely. And it can be tamed nicely in the sense that it has complete problems. And the complete problem that we're sort of interested in is the constraint satisfaction problem. It sort of says, hey, you know, every time you have something which has, uh, can be described by checking a proof, you can instead convert it into a version of this constraint satisfaction problem. So what does that mean? Really, it says, okay, well, the proof you can always write down as a sequence of bits. And what you're doing to check that the proof is correct is you perform a bunch of local checks. Each local check looks at a small constraint on a small number of bits. So for example, here you could say, hey, let's just check if the parity of these three bits is even. And then together we have all these local checks, each is you know looking at a different part of it. And then you have this local to global phenomenon, which says, if I consider combining all these checks all together, and now I have a function that takes big long strings, n bit strings, and you know decides how many checks I'm satisfying then it's NP hard to decide if there exists some assignment to these bits such that all the checks are satisfied, or is, if it's the case that there, for all assignments, at least some check is violated. So it's a really beautiful way just to think about NP in just one problem, one way of looking at proofs. And classical proofs were just the start of a very long line in computer science of understanding the complexity. And in particular, there are two extensions that are worth noting today. The first is the quantum extension, which is the class QMA, also known as quantum Merlin Arthur, in which now the proof, instead of being a sequence of classical bits, is now a collection of qubits that are entangled. So it's a quantum proof in the very sense that all the proof itself is a quantum state. And the first thing to note that is if you have a quantum proof, it's going to necessitate a quantum verifier in order to sort of understand what makes this proof more powerful than its classical counterpart. It has to be read by some quantum verifier. And just like constraint satisfaction problems provided this sort of canonical complete problem for NP, there's a canonical complete problem for QMA, and this was discovered by Kitayev. And it says, hey, calculating the ground energy of a local Hamiltonian, which is a very central object in condensed matter physics, it's a complete problem. So if, if, you could if you could figure out what the ground energy for generic local Hamiltonian systems were, you have a way of solving every problem that's in QMA. What is a local Hamiltonian? A local Hamiltonian is a linear, uh, it's defined by Hamiltonian terms, each of which is a linear local operator. So just like we had the constraint satisfaction problem acting on a few of the bits, we could have a, a term like this, which is in this case, the projector onto the state zero, 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 
and one, one, one. It's a linear operator that, um, and you can combine all these local small linear operators and you get a nice big global function on the entire state space. And that we describe, uh, we write here as a bold H and this bold H, you know, is this Hamiltonian. And there's a very simple, important thing that we need to understand about the Hamiltonian is that it's sort of a map from states to an energy, to a, to a real number. And that's just the map that takes the state psi to uh, the expectation of psi on H. And that's the energy of the system. And the QMA complete problem, again, is just calculating the ground energy. So what is the ground energy? So the ground energy is the minimum eigenvalue of this matrix H. Or another way of saying it is if you minimize over all states of this energy function, the ground energy. In the same way that in the constraint satisfaction problem, we were trying to figure out whether there exists an assignment such that C of X equals zero. Here we can say that it's QMA hard to decide if the ground energy of this Hamiltonian is less than A or greater than B, where A and B are some constants that differ by a small inverse polynomial amount. So in the CSP case, we had that B minus A equaled one. Here we can sort of adjust it a little bit uh, and we get B minus A equals one over poly M. This is sort of an artifact of the proof, but morally the, the idea is roughly the same. Now, what this tells us actually is that ground states of local Hamiltonians sort of form a canonical notion of a proof for all of QMA. Because what did we say? We said, hey, you know, QMA has this complete problem. It's this local Hamiltonian problem. And calculating the ground energy is what's really important. And how could someone prove to a, to a, to a verifier that some Hamiltonian has low energy? Well, what they literally do is they provide this ground state. They provide the state of the minimal energy, and then the verifier can check the state on this Hamiltonian, construct an estimation of the energy, and verify, lo and behold, whether it was really a low energy state or not. So it's saying something very powerful that these ground states of local Hamiltonians, which are you know, very natural objects to study if you think about condensed matter physics, that they actually play a very important role in computer science. There's sort of this canonical notion of proof. And now comes an additional pickle that is unique to the quantum situation that doesn't come from the classical. It's that because we widely believe that NP does not equal QMA. In fact, what we widely believe is that, you know, problems that are QMA complete, if, they, if you were to provide a classical witness, it would have to be super polynomial in length. The polynomial length classical witnesses, classical proofs just don't cut it for QMA. Then we get this surprising phenomenon that the ground states of local Hamiltonians should not be classically describable in an efficiently checkable manner. So what does that mean? Um, it means that you, you know that these ground states, there's no way that I could, for all local Hamiltonians, there shouldn't be any way I could describe to you the ground state in a way that convinces you that it is a ground state. You know, um, it's sort of, that sounds a little complicated, but what you could always say is, I, I shouldn't have um, an easy description that polynomial bits just can't describe this state. And so this is sort of the first indication that QMA is sort of a, you know, it's a different beast than NP, that something has to occur that, you know, that separates these two. And if you're a skeptic that QMA does not equal NP, that you, you, know, you think that these classes are probably the same, then this black box statement is sort of a target that I've painted on the back of the class QMA, which you could attack. You could prove that all ground states of local Hamiltonians, indeed they can be described classically, then you'd sort of collapse these two classes together and you would prove that NP equals QMA. So that's you know, uh, a natural thing as a, computer, as a complexity theorist to think about. Okay, but let's put that to the side for a second and let's think about the other extension of NP that also happened over the same sort of time frame, which is probably check, probabilistically checkable proofs. So probabl probabilistically checkable proofs 
come from this idea that we naturally think of proofs as requiring step-by-step checking. You know, if you have a paper that you're reading and you want to make sure that every line is correct, the only way we usually do is we say, did line 10 follow from line nine? Did line nine fall from line eight, et cetera, et cetera. And all the way at the beginning, you need to start with some assumption that we believe. And the final step has to be, you know, the answer. So proofs are in some sense, as we usually think of them as incredibly brittle objects. Even if you break at the smallest location, the whole thing can become incorrect. This notion of brittleness of proofs was sort of, was shattered entirely by the PCP theorem which is this landmark crown jewel of theoretical computer science, which said that actually every NP problem, you know, more than every proof, you can always reconstruct it. You can convert it into a form such that you only need to read a constant number of bits in order to be confident with very high probability in its validity. So So it says you don't anymore have to read line by line you in fact just can read some random section of the proof. And if the random section of the proof satisfies uh, some local conditions, then with high probability, you'll be confident that the proof was correct. Now this might seem rather miraculous, but there's another formulation that's worth thinking about, which is the PCP theorem, you could rewrite it in the following sense. You could say it's NP hard to decide if either the, co- the constraint satisfaction problem was completely decidable, completely, excuse me, completely satisfiable, as in there exists a solution which satisfied all the checks, or for all solutions, um, at least half the checks were violated. So it might be worth taking a second here to realize why this second formulation is actually equivalent to the first. So let's think of it this way. Imagine I have a solution X, a proposed solution X in front of me, and I want to decide whether I'm in situation one or two. So if I'm in situation one, no matter which clause I look at, it'll always satisfy that clause because CX equals zero, right? Whereas if I'm in situation two, I will satisfy a clause with that most 50% probability. So in some sense, what this is is saying, if I pick a random clause and check, it's like deciding if I have a coin that always comes up heads versus a coin that comes up heads at most 50% of the time. And you know, how many flips does it take to distinguish a coin that always comes up heads from a coin that comes up heads 50% of the time? It takes a constant number of checks in order to be 99% confident. So it gives you this very fast way of checking if a proof is correct or false. But there's another consequence of the, of the PCP theorem that's worth thinking about, which is that no longer do I actually have to give an exact solution proof. The exact solution proof, the X that satisfies all the checks is actually not necessary. In fact, a noisy proof is even sufficient. What do I mean by that? I mean that imagine instead I gave you an X which satisfied not all the checks, but 75% of the checks. The CX is at most M over four. Right. so if I have an X that satisfies most of the checks, I can still probabilistically verify this with constant number of queries. Why is this the case? Well, it's the case because in the first situation, it's a coin that comes up heads at least 75% of the time, right? That's what that would mean if you satisfy 75% of the checks. And in the second situation, you have a coin that comes up heads at most 50% of the time. So you have these coins which have a very different probability of coming up heads. And again, a constant number of flips would convince you of one versus the other. So the PCP theorem is saying not only that, you know, you can really quickly check proofs, but it's also saying that our notion of proofs from being this statement that exactly satisfies every constraint can now be adjusted to being something that satisfies most of the constraints. Even that is a proof of validity for NP statements. And it's a sort of shattering, right? Because now we can, take these two ideas together um, and we can start to develop some notion of quantum PCPs. So the quantum PCP is an open conjecture and it says that just like the classical PCP conjecture, it should be the case that every QMA problem, every quantum proof, you can always convert it into a form so that you only need to read 
a constant number of the qubits in order to be convinced that the proof was either correct or false. So we sort of combine these two ideas of QMA where the proof is now quantum with this idea of PCP where you only have to read a constant number of bits to check. The other way of saying this would be to say that it's QMA hard to decide the energy of a local Hamiltonian to a very large precision. What precision it's saying, actually even deciding what the first few bits of the energy is, that's hard. It's saying you can't even tell if it's completely satisfiable or if any system must violate a good fraction of the checks, some epsilon fraction of the checks. That would be the quantum PCP conjecture. But now, just like the PCP conjecture, we, are, we have to witness something sort of wild, which is that every state of energy epsilon over two times M, that's also a valid proof, right? Because just in the same, the same analogy I made about coins works in this quantum setting. It's saying that these noisy quantum proofs are also proofs that a quantum state has low, that a, excuse me, that a Hamiltonian has a low energy ground state. So our notion of proofs in the quantum setting, if you believe the quantum PCP conjecture, has to expand from just being the exact ground states of these Hamiltonians to now being all noisy states, all solutions that violate even a small fraction of the checks. These are all valid proofs of the quantum statement. And the number of proofs that violate a small fraction of checks uh, have low energy with this Hamiltonian is much, much larger than the this, uh, size of the ground space, right? It's a, it's a much bigger set. So proving the you know, QMA is separate from NP is now a much, much harder task because there's just more proofs to consider. So let's put these ideas together. So the first one was that when in the widely believed world that NP is separate from QMA, we have that quantum proofs cannot be classically described in an efficiently checkable manner. And the second was that if, you, if the quantum PCP conjecture is true, that these low energy states of the quantum PCP uh, local Hamiltonians, they're also valid proofs because they're noisy. Right? So together you get this fact that if the quantum PCB conjecture is true, that there have to exist local Hamiltonians with no succinct or efficiently uh, describable classical descriptions for any low energy state, that all the low energy states of these uh, local Hamiltonians must require a lot of, must be very hard to describe classically. So we've now painted a target on the back of the quantum PCP conjecture, which says, okay, if you don't believe the quantum PCP conjecture, then I invite you to disprove this box statement to show that every local Hamiltonian has a simple classical description for some low energy state. If you're able to do that, then you would disprove the quantum PCP conjecture outright. And this, you know, is a sort of a amazing consequence of this quantum of the quantum PCB conjecture. And it's exactly where as a skeptic, we should you know, look to see if this is true or false. And in fact, it's sort of the starting point as to where we should try to look to see if we can find a proof of the quantum PCB conjecture. Because the quantum PCB conjecture has been longstanding for almost two decades now with you know, not an insane amount of ideas towards how to prove it correctly. So maybe it's false. Maybe the way to even prove that it's false is to prove this statement. Sorry, excuse me, to disprove this statement. But the trouble is this statement is really, really hard to disprove or prove. And that's because the space of classical descriptions is an insanely vast space. It's very hard to sort of gather, get a leash on what that exactly means. So maybe we even have to go a little simpler. So what we can say is, let's, let's think of a very simple class first of classical descriptions for quantum states. And I, I claim right now that um, constant quantum circuits form such descriptions. So any state that's describable as the output of a constant depth quantum circuit, that serves as a classically checkable proof. 
And I, I promise you that, you know, in about five to 10 minutes, I will actually exactly prove this statement. But if I say, okay, let's just start with this. This is some notion of classical descriptions. What does it imply? Well, it implies this actually longstanding open conjecture called the no low energy trivial states conjecture. This was first written by uh, Friedman and Matt Hastings, who, who will be on the panel um, after this. And it said, you know, that actually there should exist local Hamiltonians such that no low energy state is the output of a constant depth circuit. So it's saying this exact statement that was we made a second ago, but we're replacing the notion of classical descriptions with this very specific classical description. And this conjecture was made in um, you know, 2013 and then published in 2014. Um, and it also withstood for nearly a decade as being open where we didn't really have any idea of Hamiltonians, which sort of demonstrated this. And then this, you know, let's, uh, let's just remark that this statement is not saying anything about computation. We sort of removed computation from the perspective and we've extracted a statement just about entanglement, about the complexity of the ground state entanglement. And that sits by itself as sort of an open conjecture to first either prove or disprove. So again, why is it fundamentally interesting? Well, if it's false, it sort of trivially disproves the quantum PCP conjecture. And second, it's also making a, a statement about physically realizable robust entanglement. It's, it's saying, you know, actually, if there were Hamiltonians which satisfied this property, they sort of demonstrate a different, uh, they're, they're, they're exotic in some sense. They're, they're very different than the Hamiltonians we usually consider. It's asking us to engineer Hamiltonians which have a robust notion of uh, entanglement. Sorry, was there a question? I thought I heard some background chatter. Um, okay, so, so this is actually exactly what we proved in our paper with Anurag, Anshu, and Nico Brookman, which is that this state, that the NLTS uh, conjecture is true. You can construct local Hamiltonians uh, for which no low energy state is the output of a constant depth circuit. And what we actually show is a little bit of a stronger statement. We show that most, and I'll say with an asterisk for now, which I, which I will you know, elaborate in due course, most codes, most optimal rate, linear rate and distance codes, quantum error correcting codes, they correspond to NLTS Hamiltonians. They all have this robust property uh, uh, for the ground space and the low energy space. Another way of saying it is we show that there exists some epsilon, some constant, and a Hamiltonian family H, these correspond to codes, so that every state pure or mixed of energy less than epsilon n, you can actually convincingly prove that any quantum circuit that generated that state or generated any state that was even close to it would require log n depth to generate. So this is not the output of a constant depth circuit in some sense. And recall that constant depth circuits, I've claimed, are classically checkable proofs. They sort of, are, if, if you have a state that's the output of a constant depth circuit, it's not really a quantum object, it's really a classical object, and I will prove that in a second. So the rest of my talk is sort of going to be an explanation of how we got to this result, how we proved this result, and where all the big ideas come from that are required to prove this theorem. So my claim, and it might be a little lofty, is that if I convince you of three sort of big ideas, that the proof just sort of comes together once you understand these three ideas. And the first of which is that trivial states, which are another way of saying states that are the output of constant depth circuits, they sort of imply a very special class of local Hamiltonians. And using that, it's very easy to prove circuit depth lower bounds, which is what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove that all these states uh, cannot be generated by low depth circuits. The second thing we're gonna sort of need to understand 
is what the low energy subspace of error correcting codes looks like. And there's some very nice pictures. And if you, I think if you understand the pictures, the rest will come together. And the third thing that we'll need to understand is sort of what happens when you think about quantum error correction? How, what is special about quantum error correction that doesn't exist in classical error correction? And how does that you know, lead to this NLTS property? So I claim that if I give you these three tools, sort of the proof will come together very quickly. Are there any questions I could take now? Um, might be a good time to pause. Any in the chat? Okay. So let's start with the first one. Let's, let's sort of understand what trivial states mean. States are the output of constant depth circuits and what that means for Hamiltonians and circuit depth. So what I'm gonna to prove to you is actually, I'm gonna to prove to you this, this uh, onsets I asked you to believe that low depth states are classical witnesses for the energy, okay? And so how, how will I prove this? So here's the first thing to think about. It said, okay, if I have an operator A and I sandwich it between a quantum circuit and this, let's think of this quantum circuit as low depth of depth T, where T is gonna be some constant. So then, what do I know about the operator that's U dagger AU? Well, first of all, what is U dagger AU? This is the time evolution of the operator A across the circuit U. So if, I, if my computation is evolving according to U, U dagger AU is the evolution of this operator according to, um, according to this unitary. And the first thing to notice is that when the circuit is low depth, the operator U dagger AU doesn't expand like crazy. Its size is actually bounded. Its size is gonna be bounded by two to the T times A. Why will it be two to the T times A? Well, I think of these circuits as being made up of two local unitaries, two local gates on each layer. And I'm not gonna specify anything about the connectivity of the circuit. It could be all to all connectivity. So every time sort of there's an information light cone that's going, starting from where the operator A acts and going out into the quantum circuit. And at each level, the light cone sort of can expand by a multiplicative factor of two. But what I get is that the description of U dagger AU is equal to the description of U dagger AU restricted to the light cone. And there's a very simple reason to see that if I have a unitary or a gate that sort of sits outside the light cone, like these ones in orange, if I was to look at the sandwich operator, it sits directly opposite its conjugate. So it just cancels. So this whole computation is going to simplify to just the computation on the light cone. And so then I can just think of that as one big unitary that acts on two to the T times A qubits. And now if I'm given a local Hamiltonian H and the state which is the, out, which is the output of a low depth circuit U, I claim I can actually exactly calculate the energy of psi with the Hamiltonian in classical time that scales two to the two to the T, but I'm gonna think of T as a constant times polynomial and N. Okay, so why is that the case? Well, here's how you could say it. So that Hamiltonian is a linear operator to sum of all these local terms. So I can just write the, the energy calculation in terms of each of these local terms. But now I take psi and I write it as u times zero, right? U, u applied to zero. And what I get now is I get a computation that acts on two to the t qubits. But if it's a computation that acts on two to the t qubits, I can just brute force calculate that with the classical computer in time two to the two to the t. So therefore I have an algorithm for computing the energy exactly in time two to the two to the t times polynomial in n, where n is the uh, number of qubits. And this is exactly proves that you know, these low depth states, they, they are classical witnesses for energy because whenever there is a low, low depth state, I don't need to you know, provide the state itself as a proof. I can instead, instead provide the circuit that generates the state and a classical computer can actually check whether that circuit was yielding a state of low energy or not. So this is why the NLTS 
a theorem is so powerful. It's saying these classical witnesses, these constant up circuits just cannot cut it for the class of Hamiltonians we're about to construct. All right, so far so good. Have I, uh, any more questions? Okay, the next thing I'm going to need to tell you is sort of that we need to understand these states, these constant up states uh, a little better. So let's just think about the following simple thought experiment, which is that the state zero, it's the unique solution to a very simple local Hamiltonian. And what that Hamiltonian, it's just this Hamiltonian where qubit by qubit, it projects away from zero, right? It projects onto the one space. So this is the Hamiltonian whose unique ground state is the all zero state. And it's a very simple Hamiltonian. It's very easy to analyze. It, it's a commuting Hamiltonian. It has a spectrum, which is all integers. And the eigenvectors uh, are just the basis vectors. And their eigenvalues are just their Hamming weights. Right? Very simple Hamiltonian. We understand it too well almost. Okay, but now let's think about what happens if I take this Hamiltonian and I rotate it or I evolve it by a unitary U. All right, let's call this HU. Well, because I evolved it by a unitary, I get that HU has to have the same spectrum. But what will happen is that the eigenvectors themselves will change. The eigenvectors will be U applied to the original eigenvectors, which were just the basis vectors, right? And let's notice something, which is that this Hamiltonian HU, it has a unique ground state. And that ground state is exactly the state, which is U applied to zero, right? So this low depth state, which is U applied to zero is the unique ground state of this Hamiltonian HU. But let's top it off by saying that HU as a Hamiltonian is a local Hamiltonian. Its locality is exactly two to the T. And its locality is two to the T just by the same light cone argument we used a slide earlier. And so now what we have is that all our low depth states, they correspond to local Hamiltonians in a very natural way. And now this actually turns out to be enough for us to prove some simple notions of circuit depth lower bounds. So what I'm going to show in a second is that if you have two states which are what I call locally indistinguishable, then they have, there's a simple argument to prove that these states cannot be the output of low depth circuits. Or in other words, every, if I can prove that a state is locally indistinguishable, I actually have a, a very rigorous argument for a circuit depth lower bound. So what does it mean for two states to be locally indistinguishable? Well, two states are gonna be locally indistinguishable if for all reduced density matrices, of size D, the marginal states, the reduced states on those, on those small regions are identical. Ready? So maybe an example is illustrative. Ready? The cat yeah. states, which are the, uh, hello? The cat states, which are the, you know, also known as the GHZ states, which are the superposition of all zeros and all ones with a sign, either a plus or a minus these two states are locally indistinguishable from each other. They're actually n minus one locally indistinguishable. And this isn't too hard to realize. One can simply just check and calculate what the reduced density matrix would be on any n minus one qubits. And it actually is very simple. The reduced density matrix sort of just loses the sign. It just becomes the mixture, the classical mixture of either all zeros or all ones. So now I'm gonna prove a circuit depth lower bound given just this fact of being D locally indistinguishable. So here's what I'll claim. I'll claim that if two states are D locally indistinguishable, then any circuit that generates either state must require at least log depth, log D depth. Okay, so how will I prove this? Well, we, we haven't developed too many tools so far, so I'll just use all the ones we know. So what's the first thing we're gonna do? Well, we, we're gonna use a Hamiltonian. What's a good Hamiltonian to use? Well, we spent some time on the previous slide generating this Hamiltonian HU, this Hamiltonian whose unique ground state is the state psi, right? And I'm gonna, 
I'm going to just consider the thought experiment, which is what is the energy of psi prime with this Hamiltonian HU? Well, I can write HU as a sum of local terms, HI. But then what I'm going to see is that the energy of HI with psi prime is exactly equal to the energy of HI with psi. And these energies are going to be equal because HU is the local Hamiltonian. But these states are locally indistinguishable on larger regions than the size of each of the locality of HU. So what that's saying, in fact, this is where the term locally indistinguishable comes from. It's saying that the Hamiltonian HU cannot differentiate the states psi prime and psi. They are identical to, to this Hamiltonian, which means that the energy is exactly equal to the energy uh, of HU with psi, which is zero. So I get that both psi prime and psi are ground states of this Hamiltonian HU. But the point I uh, hopefully stressed earlier was that the Hamiltonian HU has a unique ground state. It's, it has a unique ground state, which is psi. So now I have this contradiction, right? That I have, the, I have a Hamiltonian, which has two ground states, which are not unique. And the only way that could happen is if psi equaled psi prime. And, and there's our contradiction. So this tells me that, you know, if I, if I can find local indistinguishability, it's a way of proving circuit depth lower bounds. So in some sense, my, my new, my tar, my, I've shifted the goalposts a little bit. Originally, when we talked about NLTS, we said, okay, we want to prove circuit depth lower bounds for all the low energy states. And now in some sense, I'm saying, really the way to go about doing this is we first find local indistinguishability. And then we sort of prove a little more about that. So we should go looking for where local indistinguishability occurs. But before we go out about you know, finding local indistinguishability, there's one thing to note, which is that this lemma here is, in, is it's very brittle. And the, the, the thing we don't want is any brittleness. We sort of want robustness. That's the whole idea of this exercise and PCPs and, and LTS is it's all about robustness, right? Well, in order to use this lemma, I needed that psi and psi prime were exactly locally indistinguishable, which means that on all local regions, the reduced density matrices were exactly equal. But what if I don't have that? What if I have that on re the reduced density matrices are approximately equal to one another, or on the most regions, they're exactly equal? What if, you know, like if I just, you know, shift this a little bit, add a little noise, does the same statement hold? Well, the problem is that this, this argument on the previous slide, it really, the crux was that there was a unique ground state. And you can make it a little bit robust, but you can't make it too robust because the spectral gap of this Hamiltonian was really small. It was one. So what that turns it out to be in terms of robustness is it's robust to small perturbations of order one over n. So it says any state in a small, very minuscule ball around psi and psi prime must also have high uh, circuit complexity. But it's not saying anything about like a constant sized ball around psi and psi prime, which is something we definitely need. So first thing we'll have to do is sort of, we need to take this lemma, which is allowing us to prove circuit depth lower bounds and make it a little bit more robust. And so this is where we can use some math from Chebyshev polynomials. And we can prove this, this theorem I present in front of you. Don't read it for a second, just uh, listen to me for a split second and then we can go through it. So what is it saying? It's gonna say that if I have a distribution on the Boolean hypercube, and this distribution puts mass on two regions, well, I'll call S1 and S2. And these regions in the Boolean hypercube are far apart from each other. Then any quantum circuit that generates this distribution, and you can think of that as you apply a uh, quantum circuit and then you measure in the standard basis or in the Hadamard basis, any quantum circuit that generates this distribution must have required log depth to generate, log n depth to generate. The formal version is what's written here but that this is morally what you want to think of. So this is sort of saying that the cat state example I previously said for local indistinguishability, I can make that robust. 
So recall the cat state is the state which has half mass on the zero state and half mass on the all one state. And what we're saying here is, well, we can actually make that robust in the following sense. The mass no longer needs to be half and half on both parts, as long as it's any small constant mu, that's okay, as long as it's bounded away from zero. And furthermore, I don't need that the mass to be on these points exactly of the Boolean hypercube, as long as there's some regions, S1 and S2 that I can generate, I can prove this lower bound. So this is sort of the robust version of the lower bound we stated previously given local indistinguishability. And just a simple proof sketch on how one might do this. Well, we want to use the local indistinguishability ideas we just stated, but we're going to have to make them a little bit more approximate. So what we say is if there was a state psi which generated this distribution, then you could always find some region R which encapsulates S2. So that if I considered the state psi prime, or what I do is I take psi and I just flip the sign on all the parts that are in R. So I get two states psi and psi prime, that these states are approximately locally indistinguishable. And then I sort of use the same ideas that we did in the previous slide to massage this into a circuit depth lower bound. So the theorem I have here in front of you is sort of the backbone behind how we're gonna prove the NLTS result. We need some way of arguing circuit depth lower bound. And what we're gonna say is, if I can prove that I generate distributions that's, you know, that look like this, then I have, uh, this must have come from a high depth circuit. So let's, let's give these distributions a name for the simplicity of the rest of the talk. Let's call them well-spread. And what does it mean in context of NLTS? It says, well, okay, if you wanna prove the NLTS result, you, what you need to do is you need to show that there exists a local Hamiltonian whose entire low energy space, so every state of low energy, if measured in either the X or the Z basis, it's going to induce such a well-spread distribution, such a well-spread classical distribution. So again, now we've, we, we just keep, we're, all we're doing this whole talk is we're just going to slightly move the goalpost as we narrow in towards something that's a little bit more tractable. So now we have a target here, which is we want to find well-spread distributions. But we're gonna keep in mind that all this idea is about local indistinguishability and are still very relevant and you know should sort of spearhead how we think about these things. Okay, so now we get to part two of the talk, which is where, where are we gonna find such well-spread distributions? And the best place to look for them, I claim, is in error correction. In fact, we can start to see that well-spread distributions appear by just looking at classical error correction. So the classical error correction is a very you know, well-studied field. Many people know it a lot better than I will ever. But the thing one should think about is that in classical error correction, you have this notion of a linear code. The linear code is the kernel of some check matrix. So just a Boolean matrix, H, and we're looking at all solutions. And what I claim that all you need from classical error correction is the following picture, which is that if I have a low energy state, a state that violates a few of the checks of this classical error correcting code, what does that space look like? What does the space of states that violate few checks look like? So first things to note is that the space that violates a few checks will of course include all the code words, which are these black dots in the centers of these clusters. But the second thing to note is that because we're gonna consider local codes, the regions around the code words themselves, these are the regions in Hamming distance, they also will all be low energy. But sort of the amazing thing is that with high probability, if my code is expanding uh, or you know it's like from a, a myriad of random constructions there will also be these extra sort of phantom clusters that appear um that i've drawn out here that uh you know don't contain any original code word but the amazing fact is that these clusters sit far apart from each other so what i get is that the low energy space of a random classical error correcting code 
it looks like the disjoint union of a bunch of clusters. And the fun thing about these clusters is that they're all far apart from each other. The code with high probability is gonna have linear distance. And I get that the distance between all these clusters is also a linear function of n. So first off, this is the start of what could be a well-spread distribution, right? Because I have that a lot of regions that are all far apart from each other. So if I, it, it sort of plays the role of a support for a distribution that we hope to prove is well-spread. It says, okay, look, if, if, you know, if I'm only have mass on these uh, coat, on these green regions, then my distribution's on its way to being well-spread. The only issue is that I, I have no way of proving that my distribution isn't concentrated on any one cluster. If I just thought of the Hamiltonian that corresponds to a classical code, there's no way I could prove, and it's false actually, that the distribution is well-spread. In order to get this well-spreadness property, I'm going to need a, something a little bit more. But the low energy space of this code is, it's a good start. It's, a, it's the support, it's exactly what we're looking for, but it's not quite there. Um, to prove, you know, um, that... So, Ch so Chinmay, so there's a question about, from the audience. Uh, how do we know the existence of these phantom clusters that don't have code words? Ah, okay. So let's, let's actually go through it. At, at a high level, um, you can prove that if, the, if you take this code and you write down this adjacency graph that corresponds to it, so that's like this graph between bits and checks, if the graph is small set expanding, um, then it, it's actually just this inherent fact of being small set expanding that induces these phantom clusters. And it's not too many calculations. Um, and I, I don't think we have time today, but that, that's really the picture. <clears throat> that if you have this uh, small set expansion, you, you know, you, you can do some quick light algebra and get to it. Um, we have it written in our result or, um, in my thesis, if, you, if someone wants a, like a little bit of a closer look at it. Yeah, the, the phantom cluster, an intuition as to why a phantom cluster exists is perhaps if I take the check matrix H and I remove a row entirely, so I remove one of the checks. Now, now what I'm gonna be left with is another check matrix for with high probability, another very good code but that code is gonna have twice the dimension that the original code did. So there have to be two times as many solutions to this guy. And those new solutions have to be far apart from all the old solutions and far apart from all the new solutions also, because this is a new code. So those guys are actually the cores of these new phantom clusters. So, right, so we're sort of saying these phantom clusters appear because I can, you know, move a little bit in Hamming distance, or I could start to remove checks entirely and violate, and, or I could do with some combination of both. And that's what induces these phantom clusters. I hope that uh, helps the asker of the question. Okay, so 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 far, we, you know, we, we've said that, okay, we, we, we're looking for well-spreadness. We sort of see it coming out of error correction but we don't exactly see it because all we're getting is supports of distributions that kind of look like this. We need to now show that distributions actually are spread. So in order to do that, we're gonna require quantum error correction. And this is where it's helpful to sort of understand some principal properties of quantum error correction. So the greatest thing about quantum error correction in my, I believe is that it corrects erasure errors. And this is wildly fascinating. So if I have uh, a quantum error correcting code and I remove a, a correctable region, so this is a region which I was supposed to be able to correct, um, there exists a recovery map from where I can take the region where that erasure error occurred and I can correct back to get the state. But let's consider the thought experiment where that erased component, I keep it, right? I just remove it and then I apply the recovery map on the other side. So now I have the removed region and I have the re reconstituted state all by itself. 
So this, this should scream violating no cloning theorem right away, right? And the only resolution of how this doesn't violate no cloning is that the removed region contains no information about the original state. That way I could have just constructed the removed region all by itself without, uh, remo you know, without this procedure. Or in other words, what it's saying is that what, no matter what code state I encode in my error correcting code, any correctable region contains absolutely no information about the encoded state. Or in other words, that's exactly local indistinguishability. It's saying that quantum error correction implies local indistinguishability for error correcting codes. So immediately you get that if you have a quantum code of distance D, the exact solutions require circuit depth log D to generate. So this is just to be another indication that, you know, thinking about codes with the right path in order to prove circuit lower bounds, because these exact solutions have this circuit depth lower bound that's almost immediate, right? And furthermore, these quantum error correcting codes, they actually induce natural local Hamiltonians. And that's just a Hamiltonian where there's a Hamiltonian term for every check that the code has. So every stabilizer check of this code, there is a corresponding Hamiltonian term. The open question that we still need to resolve is how do you prove these circuit depth lower bounds? How do you prove that they, the low energy states induced well-spread distributions? So to do that in uh, you know, the last minutes, what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to start thinking about a specific class of codes. And the very specific class of codes that we should use are these CSS codes, calderbrack shorstein codes, which sort of, which correct the two types of uh, fundamental errors, bit flips and phase flips independently. And the reason why we really wanna think about CSS codes is that thinking about CSS codes is very useful because we can understand the induced distributions of these codes very well. They're really the right way to think about CSS codes, in my opinion, is you can think about what the distributions look like when I measure uh, code words or low energy words of these CSS codes. So they're constructed from these classical codes. The details here are a little bit less important, but the, the real detail to think about is actually this picture over here. That if I was to measure the CSS code in the Z basis, I'm going to get a cluster distribution. I'm going to get measurements that occur in these blue regions. The distance between these blue regions is actually the Z distance of the code. And sort of the size of the blue regions is determined by the rate of the X code. So both these codes, their properties are playing a role in what this distribution looks like, but we're getting a cluster distribution. So now that we have a cluster distribution, at least just for the ground states, what we want is, hey, what happens in the low energy perspective? So imagine we had a CSS code where the low energy state looked just like the previous pictures, but sort of combining the two ideas together, that it clusters just nicely. We have these clusters that scale around the original um, code, but then maybe these phantom clusters also start to pop up. But as long as the distance between all the clusters is low, then we're good. And what this actually uh, requires is sort of an, a notion of expansion for both the check matrices in the X and Z basis. And the miraculous thing is that there's this deep connection that's going on here between you know, this expansion in the X and Z basis. In last year's colloquium, we heard a talk about how to construct linear rate and linear distance codes and its connection to the C cubed local testability conjecture. And you know, all these ideas are, they're all sort of facets of the same notion. There's somehow there has to be this deep expansion going on. And what we write here is sort of uh, an amplification of the notion of distance. Um, so if we have this sort of amplified notion of distance, um, we, we get a picture that looks like this. And now, what I get is the exact same thing I said about the support for the classical picture, which is that if I have a low energy state, when I measure in the Z basis, I'm going to get a distribution that is highly supported on these clusters. That low energy states in the Z basis, the, you know, the, 
the distribution, at least at the moment, has the support of a well-spread distribution. We haven't proven that it is well-spread. It has the support of a well-spread distribution. But the key fact, the key differentiator between what the quantum example that we're doing now and the classical example that failed last time was that in, in reality, there's actually two pictures going on. There's the picture in the Z basis drawn here, and there's a picture, an identical picture that's going on in the X basis. And the fact of the matter is that having the same picture go on in both bases at the same time is what's gonna be able to prove well-spread distribution. What we're gonna show is that either the induced Z distribution or the X distribution of these codes is well-spread. We're, we're, and we're gonna do this with an uncertainty principle. So that's the next step. So, so far we have supports that look kind of well-spread. Now we need to argue that they actually, you know, really have mass everywhere. So we wanna prove there's sort of a partition where half the mass is on one side, half the mass is on the other, or not even half. We just need to say that there's some constant mass on both sides of this cup. To do that, all I really need to do is I need to show that not too much mass, let's say 99% of the mass is concentrated on any one cluster. Because what that will show is that at least something like one over 400, doesn't really matter the constants, mass is on either side of some partition. And that will give us our circuit depth lower bound. To do this, as I said before, we're gonna need to realize that we have the picture going on the X, in the X picture and the Z picture simultaneously. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, let's assume that the picture was clustered in the Z picture, say. Then we're gonna argue that it cannot be clustered in the X picture. And that would prove that the X distribution is well spread. So to do that, we need some uncertainty principle. There's a lot of uncertainty principles, just like anti-commutation of observables. Here's one about measuring in the all X or all Z basis. It says that, you know, if you concentrate in the Z basis, then you have to be spread in the X basis. That's roughly what this uncertainty principle says. So we'll apply that. We'll say, uh, let's assume that the Z distribution is concentrated on some Z cluster. Then for any X cluster, it's not, con it's not concentrated. The way we'll need to do that is we're gonna to need to understand what the sizes of these clusters are to apply this distribution because there's this error term in the uncertainty principle. And the size of the cluster is not too hard to calculate. It's sort of a combination of two numbers, right? One is the size of the initial quantum object, which is this two to the Rx term. This, is the, this comes from the CSS fact. And the other one is this combinatorial term, which is sort of the bubbling out as I consider low energy states. And you can bound this, you know, by just some trivial math identities. And likewise, you'll get a bound on the Z, on the X picture. And so, you know, you just put these guys together and you say, okay, well, if I have 99% of my mass on um, the Z picture, then the amount of mass I have on the X picture uh, is bounded by this result. Now note this interesting property that comes up that you know maybe we'll talk about a little bit in the panel is why does this rate term pop up? Is, is it, we don't actually uh, understand truly if this is an artifact of the proof or something a little bit um, more powerful, but, but the rate term pops up here. And so what you get is that, you know, if your energy though, if you're considering a linear rate code, as long as the epsilon that we're selecting is, you know, smaller than k over n squared, then you get this um, sort of well-spread distribution in the X picture as well. So what, what we've proven to wrap up is we said, hey, if I measure this quantum error correcting code in the X or Z basis, at least one of those pictures has to be this well-spread distribution. And that's gonna hold for any low energy state. And that's a combination of expansion and uncertainty principle. So to, to conclude, what we said is we, you know, we've sort of provided all the little ingredients. One is that how does uh, well-spreadness provide um, circuit depth lower bounds? And you know, we showed that using some simple examples of local indistinguishability. 
Then we said, if you have these codes with these optimal parameters, which you know took uh, there's a line of work that reached it, but if you have such codes, then it's not too much more work to actually show that they have this NLTS property. We sort of combined some simple ideas about what the induced distributions look like, and we're able to rigorously argue these circuit depth lower bounds. And you know, the, the first thing I'll say just before we start the panel is in terms of quantum PCP conjecture, you know, you, you might ask me, what does it say about this? And I'll probably say that it doesn't say anything about whether the quantum PCP conjecture is more likely to be true. Maybe the right way to say it is it says it's much harder to prove it's false now because this very simple target that we could paint on the back of the quantum PCP conjecture um, no longer holds. So if we're going to disprove it, we're going to have to require some more fancy machinery than just constant depth circuits. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more in the panel in due course. Um, so maybe with that, Umesh, I should conclude and take some questions. And Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Jinma, for a great talk. Um, so uh, let's see if there are any questions from the audience. And also, Jinma, if you stop sharing, maybe uh, they can yeah. uh, start uh, pinning the the video the yeah videos of the of the panelists. So so um, let's see. Are there any any questions from, from the audience? Please feel free to either speak up or raise your hands or put it in the. I see know, some there. hands raised digitally, but I can't seem to approve them. Uh, let me see. Okay, why am I not? Uh, 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 Peter oh, and, I, I, I and see. Okay. Takahashi. Uh, okay, so Pete, Peter, could you could you yeah. ask a question? Hi there. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of really basic questions. Um, how um, how do these quantum complexity problems like the PQ, uh, QPCP conjecture, um, you know, correspond to uh, you know, very physical things like Hamilton ground state energies, and then kind of like a follow up. Um, how does it relate to the Yang Mills Yang Mills mass gap uh, problem? Please, I can uh, certainly answer the first. I, I'm not actually sure what the Yang Mills gap is, so maybe not the second. Um, the first one, I can say that these Hamiltonians that we're constructing. They're very engineered objects. They in fact cannot exist on any constant dimensional lattice Hamiltonian. So this isn't sort of the object which uh, if you are, you know, study condensed matter physics traditionally, you know, where you think about lattices of spin systems, et cetera, that you would, these are not those types of Hamiltonians. This is sort of condensed matter plus plus. It's saying something about what is the natural computer science extension of this. Um, so, you know, it's not, there's not, nothing is coming to break laboratories uh, of condensed matter physicists around the world. Um, this is more of a theoretical idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, um, Umesh, can, can you comment on the um, Yang, Yang Mills mass gap um, theorem? Is, is there any relationship? Because that's to do with ground state Hamiltonians, right? Or, or the spectral gap? Um, you know, I, I'm, uh, could, I'm not sure. Um, maybe could you could you could you state oh. a little more about it or why? Sure. Oh, I mean, I, I can just say I don't think it's really closely related to the Yang Mills mass gap question. Yang uh, Mills theories are non abelian quantum field theories. The mass oh. gap is essentially uh, in these uh, non relativistic quantum theories that we're looking at. The mass yeah. gap is analogous to the spectral gap of the operator. Um, yeah you would have to take some kind of uh, continuum limit in order to say anything about Yang Mills. And that's wow. not really in the cards here because this is a, a discrete finite size thing with the finite dimensional Hilbert spaces in discrete locations. So I don't think there's really a deep connection with Yang Mills. Uh, because Yang Mills is obviously one of the seven millennial problems. So I thought maybe it would shine some light on solving that big problem. And then you could get the million dollar prize. But um, it doesn't seem like there is. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot for the question. 